This class is a study of the artists, theories, and techniques that have shaped our view of photography and how photography has shaped our view of the world. Photography encompasses art, science, technology, journalism, folk art, meaning snapshots, and business. This class will touch on all of these areas, but will concentrate on photographic art. The birth of photography convened through advances in science and art. Photography emerged from experiments in chemistry and optics, mixed with the period's artistic pursuit that attempted to factually render the natural world. Prior to the introduction of photography, it was largely the responsibility of artists and illustrators, like this Da Vinci piece that you see here, to record historic human events. As business people, artists and inventors were always looking for aids to improve the ease and accuracy of drawing, but without the burden of extensive training. In Canaletto's painting from 1727, you see Renaissance perspective, a way of simulating three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional plane. Several of these inventions involve the use of chemicals, optics, and light. The simple physical principle that light, unobstructed or reflected, travels in a straight line. This led to advancements that edged us closer to the invention of photography. One such discovery was the simple silhouette, using light and shadow as a means to reproduce nature. Silhouettes were common in the 18th century. You see examples here from Charles Wilson Peale, Philadelphia artist, naturalist, scientist, politician. Peale was a successful artist living in Philadelphia, and he set up one of the very first museums in this country. But a more important precursor to photography was the camera obscura literally meaning dark room or light chamber. It's the first, its first known description of a camera obscura was in the fifth century. Initially, camera obscuras were rooms large enough to stand in. Without windows, the room were dark with the exception of a small hole in the wall. Light reflecting off of objects traveled in a straight line comes through the hole and illustrates illuminates the opposite wall with an image of what was lit outside. It was also discovered that the size of the camera's hole, or aperture, was linked to the sharpness of the projected image. So in this example that you see, this is a camera obscura room with a lens or a hole on each side of the wall. You can see that here and here. Again, light traveling in a straight line, light reflected off the top of the tree, would project and come through that hole traveling in a straight line. And if the artist was to place a piece of glass or vellum or some other way that they could trace directly from nature, the light of nature, you could see the light would travel in a straight line. And so something at the top of a building or a tree would end up at the bottom in that projection. So everything was upside down and backwards in a camera obscura. By the time of the Renaissance, roughly the 14th through 17th centuries, artists employed this device often. In the late 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci explained, quote, when the images of illuminated objects pass through a small round hole into a very dark room, if you receive them on a piece of white paper placed vertically in the room at some distance from the aperture, you will see on the paper all those objects in their natural shapes and colors. They will be reduced in size and upside down owing to the intersection of the rays at the aperture. If these images come from a place which is illuminated by the sun, they will seem as if painted on paper. By 1611, tents and wagons had 
converted into portable camera obscuras. However, neither were easy to transport or practical to move to a remote site. Some way of portability was needed to make the camera obscura more useful. In this piece from Vermeer, this is controversial, but one of the reigning theories is that this was painted with the aid of either a camera obscura or a camera lucida. Indeed, a, the use of a lens of some sort. The reason for that, you'll notice in the foreground, the edge of the table here is painted out of focus. Well, indeed, prior to this time and prior to the use of lenses, an artist who was able to paint accurately or draw accurately could simply transfix the focus of their eye from one place to another and paint each area accurately. But a lens doesn't always see that way. A lens focused on middle ground will sometimes not have background or foreground in focus. And so this is convincing evidence that Vermeer may have used the aid of a camera obscura or a lenticular device. In this piece, Abelardo Morel is a contemporary Boston-based photography photographer, excuse me, created this piece simply by photographing a light bulb turned on. Next to it, you'll see a simple cardboard box where he's cut a hole, taped on a lens to help sharpen the image. But again, the light traveling through that light bulb goes through a straight line through that lens and ends up projecting its image upside down and backwards inside that portable camera obscura. Another one of Morel's pieces where he would set up in buildings. This one in my former residence, and not my particular residence, but in St. Louis, where I lived for 19 years. You'll see that uh, in this storeroom, he covered all the windows with black plastic, cut a small hole about half the size of a dime in one area to let light through. If you sat in that room and gave your eyes a long enough period to adjust, you would see that there's an image coming through that hole that projects itself throughout the room, the floor, the ceiling, uh, and the walls. Again, everything upside down and backwards. Let me show you a quick YouTube on how to create a camera obscura. The ERA is not about the Sorry about quality. the ad here. It's about power. One of my colleagues lived in downtown Seattle. She told me that one of their bathrooms looked over downtown. They painted the window black, scratched out a small hole, and theoretically you could sit there on the toilet, turn off the lights, and uh, see a, is a dark image of Seattle room, projected. Uh, any size that has an opening looking out into the world. Uh, through that opening, uh, an upside-down image of the outside actually gets projected on the back of that room. It's a very simple physical uh, process. The earliest version of an easily portable camera obscura was simply a vertical sheet of glass onto which some sort of translucent paper like vellum or tracing paper was attached. Opposite this glass was affixed an eyepiece or sight to keep the artist's perspective constant. 
The draftsmen then simply drew on the vellum the images that they could see through the glass. However, the use of vellum diffused the light, reducing image clarity, thus making tracing from nature still difficult and still requiring skill. An example of a portable camera obscura here. Again, a box, a fixed piece of glass, often ground glass, and in this case a mirror, and also a lens to sharpen the light. Again, the light coming through the lens would strike the mirror. The mirror would project it up onto the glass. The artist could put tracing paper or vellum there and again trace directly from nature. In the 17th century, a lens was affixed to a small box with a piece of ground glass. Essentially, the camera obscura was now portable. It's thought 17th century Dutch painter Johan Vermeer used the camera obscura, as I showed you earlier. In 1413, theories of linear perspective were developed to enable artists to render scenes in a seemingly accurate and believable spatial order. Camera obscura images conform to the Renaissance idea of linear perspective as both employed a one-point perspective. Another artist aid was the Camera Lucida. Developed in 18, 1807, the Camera Lucida is actually an optical instrument for drawing in broad daylight. With the Camera Lucida, paper was laid fat, flat above a prism supported by a rod. Centered over the prism, a small sight was placed, allowing the artist to view both subject and paper simultaneously. Like the Camera Obscura, the Camera Lucida allowed tracing directly from nature. Here's an example of Constant Talbot, the wife of William Henry Fox Talbot, who we'll learn about more in the next lecture. Nonetheless, the camera obscura required some drawing skill. It was frustration with this device that led one of the inventors of photography to turn to chemicals to experiment with fixing a light image. Another camera lucida example, this one again by one of the early inventors of photography or one of the early scientists involved in photography, Sir John Herschel. A more contemporary example of the use of a camera lucida is British-based David Hockney, sp splits his time between the States and Britain, did a whole series of recent portraits using the aid of a camera lucida. Though there was some knowledge of light-sensitive properties of chemical substances as early as the 1600s, it would be two more centuries before the idea of trying to create an image with light-sensitive chemicals within a camera obscura would be tried. Italian Angelo Sala experimented with silver salts in 1614. He demonstrated that the sun blackened powdered silver nitrate but he believed that the darkening resulted from exposure to the air rather than light. In the 1700s, silver nitrate was commonly used to dye feathers, furs, and leathers. In 1727, German scientist Johann Schultz published his findings that upon exposure to light, a substance containing calcium nitrate and silver carbonate turned dark. Silver nitrate still composes most contemporary photographic emulsions. Schultz wrote, I covered most of the glass with dark material, exposing a little part for the free entry of light. Thus I wrote names and whole sentences on paper and carefully cut away the inked parts with a sharp knife. I struck the paper, thus perforating on glass with wax. It was not long before the sun's rays, where they hit the glass through the cutout parts of the paper, wrote each word or sentence on the chalk precipice so exactly and distinctly that many who were curious about the experiment but ignorant of the nature 
took occasion to attribute the thing to some sort of trick. After further experiments, Schultz concluded that it was light, not heat, that affected these chemicals. Though he figured this an important discovery, Schultz nonetheless had no practical uses for it. Though this experiment was widely known and easily repeatable, no one yet had figured out a way to retard or stop the chemical reaction to light. Ten years later, in 1737, a Parisian did announce a practical use for Schultz's discovery, secret writing. Using a weak silver nitrate solution as ink, words were written on paper would remain as invisible as long as they were kept in the dark. But on exposure to light, words would appear for all to see. After Schultz, many experimented with various silver compounds, but always the problem was the inability to stop the darkening action of the silver without simply placing it in darkness. Thomas Wedgwood was born into a long line of British manufacturers. He was well-educated and instilled with a love for art. Wedgwood spent much of his short life associating with painters, sculptors, and poets. He inherited his father's wealth and he became an art patron. With his business partner, Humphrey Davy, the two experimented with light-sensitive chemicals, placing objects painted and painted transparencies atop sections of white leather and paper sensitized with silver nitrate. The two became the first to try to chemically record an image from nature directly from the means of light. These are not his examples, but similar to ones he would have created. Davy wrote, White paper or white leather moistened with solution of nitrate of silver undergoes no change when kept in a dark place. But on being exposed to daylight, it speedily changes color and after passing through different shades of gray and brown becomes at lengthy nearly black. Wedgwood also had the idea of fixing images with the camera obscura, but his experiments appear simply were not exposed long enough to record an image. Examples of Wedgwood's light-sensitive work did not survive. Or did they? From the New York Times, April 17, 2008, quote, The phone call was routine, the kind that often made before big auctions. Sotheby was preparing to sell a striking rust-brown image of a leaf on paper, long thought to have been made by William Henry Fox Talbot, one of the inventors of photography. So the auction house contacted a Baltimore historian considered to be the world's leading Talbot expert and asked if he could grace the sales catalog with an interesting scholarly detail about the print known as a photogenic drawing a pr crude precursor to the photograph. Historian Larry Schaff recalled, quote, I got back to them and said, well, the first thing I would tell you is this was not made by Talbot. Currently, speculation is this image might be made by Thomas Wedgwood, or possibly Wedgwood's family friend, Henry Bright, or his father. It is now thought that this image dates back to the 1790s, if true, making it the first known photograph. While Wedgwood and his circle of friends seem to have discovered the development of images through a chemical reaction to light, again, they still lacked a consist consistent means to fix or stop that development action. <laughs>